Hi, everyone, and welcome to Things We Said Today, a Beatles podcast and video cast uh, where we discuss anything and everything about the Beatles together, solo, everything in between, Apple Records, Dark Horse Records, Yoko Ono, we'll touch it all. If it's Beatles related here on Things We Said Today. My name is Darren DeVivo. I'm from WFUV Radio in New York City a non-commercial radio station in New York City at 90.7 FM and 90.7 FM HD2. And uh, I've been on the air at WFUV, not quite, but almost 40 years. In fact, the 40th anniversary, actually, no, I'm still a couple of years away from my first 40th anniversary of my first show. But anyway, uh, I've been at FUV forever. And um, it gives me great pleasure to be on this show with two of my friends, fellow radio veteran, Ken Michaels, one of our hosts. He's been broadcasting a little longer than I've been. Um, and most of his time on the radio has been hosting Beatles-related programming. Most recently, the syndicated radio show, Every Little Thing. And on top of that, Ken is also uh, the co-host of another video cast, Talk More Talk, a solo Beatles video cast. And in addition to that, there's Ken Michaels Radio, which is his YouTube uh, page, uh, YouTube channel, YouTube page, where you could check out even more interviews and whatnot from Ken. So he's all over the internet. Um, so Ken, welcome aboard. It's great to have you here. Thank you, Darren. Looking forward to another great show. That Mets cap is just glued to your head, isn't it? <laughs> How'd you, how can you tell? Do you sleep with that on? <laughs> no. I do not, especially not the way they're playing lately. Right. Um, and also Alan Cozen, uh, a, a critically acclaimed journalist, uh, both uh, in the world of Beatles music and classical music. Uh, right now, I think the focus is all on the McCartney legacy, uh, which is uh, a book that Alan is co-writing with Adrian Sinclair. Volume one of the McCartney legacy is coming at the end of the year, I can never remember the date, but I think it's in November. December 13th. It's December 13th. I'll, by December 14th, I'll remember the day the book came out. Full title is uh, The McCartney Legacy, Volume 1, 1969 to 1973. Alan's also uh, contributes to The New York Times, The Wall Street Journal, to name two. He's written other books on the Beatles in the past. And it gives me great pleasure to welcome Alan Cozen. How are you, Alan? Great, Darren. How are you? All righty. Uh, doing good. Doing good. So we're here. Time for another show. Mm. But before the show, it's news time. So we turn to Ken Michaels. All right, Darren. There's plenty of news to get to. I mean, since our last show, so much has happened in between already. Hmm. But um, we'll start with um, the Revolver box set which now has a release date. It's official of October 28th. Uh, there will be various versions coming out uh, presented in special edition, edition packages. There'll be a Super Deluxe 5 CD set, a Super Deluxe 4 LP set, a Deluxe 2 CD version, a standard 1 CD version, a limited edition picture disc, and a standard one album vinyl. Also uh, digital, it'll be available digitally and for streaming. The Super Edition 5 CD set is selling for $139.99 on Amazon. You can pre-order it now. And the 4LP plus 7-inch vinyl EP runs for $199. And um, yeah, so it is official October the 28th. And uh, from what I've been hearing, because there's a lot of complaints, no uh, Blu-ray, no 5.1. Uh, there will be a Dolby Atmos, but that's only available for streaming. Is there anything else that you guys have heard about this? The, uh, the version, the remix version, by the way, of Taxman has come out on streaming services. You can listen to it on YouTube, um, probably Spotify. I've listened to it on YouTube. Um, anything you guys have heard? I think the Atmos version may be purchasable as a download as well. So I, I don't know if it's just streaming. I hope not. Um, 
I think you might be able to to buy it, but then you'd be getting it as files. You know, in other words, when you buy the digital version of the album, I think you can get the Atmos with that. That's as I understand it. So the way the press release sort of looked. You know, I wish these releases they would just conform to one standard way of handling it. All Beatle albums, it's been decided, would come with a uh, a Blu-ray audio disc. Yeah. You can count on that, or or two of them if need be for whatever reason. I still, honestly, cannot totally wrap my hands around the whole surround at most five point one and a half and square root to three. Um, uh, but a standard way of approaching these box sets, and I think was it um, Flaming Pie when Flaming Pie came out? There was a whole thing about downloadable additional bonus tracks that wasn't on the physical. It may not have been Flaming Pod, but it was one of McCartney. Flowers in the Dirt. There was. There uh, that's whole- what I mean. I'm sorry. That's what I meant. Flowers in the Dirt. Where for that one album, you couldn't get all the material. Essentially, if you went with the physical format, you had to do the, some downloading. Why? Just can we make it like easier? Bad enough. I get confused with the multi disc sets, the multi multi vinyl sets, then, you know, the two CD set, the one CD set, black vinyl, green vinyl. Picture disc, <laughs> red cassettes. I mean, there have been colored cassettes too in some the, some of these reissue campaigns with some artists. It's like, can you we make this easy? Please. Well, a lot of that is geared towards the collector. I know, and I'm a collector, and you blow my mind. I go end up having to go take a nap after I order something. Uh, I know it gets really confusing, but. Um... You know, there are those people who want the vinyl version, not because they're a collector, but because they prefer vinyl. But all the picture to stuff and the colored vinyl and all that, that's all for collectors. But And to me, the surround mixes have been pretty much the main events of a lot of these. <laughs> for the, some people, yeah, it is. And... I mean, the, the, the outtakes are, okay, the outtakes are the main, main event. But in terms of the remix, for me, it's the surround rather than just the stereo remix. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm hoping that's downloadable, uh, you know, and I think we, I talked about this last time. You, you can you can put the files on a um, on a thumb drive and put the thumb drive into the into the input slot of your Blu-ray player and play it through Blu-ray um, because obviously my Blu-ray is hooked up for 5.1 but my computer is not you know so having them downloaded onto my computer doesn't really do me any good if i don't have a blu-ray disc i need to have them on the files and i've also discovered lately that only flac and possibly wave files work but the m4a files which is what you get from say apple um I can't play those through the Blu-ray player. So, um, you know, in, in a way, amplifying Darren's confusion about some of this stuff, you know, if you really want the surround mix, um, I hope they're making it available in a format that you can download and play. Um, I don't mind having to download it. Uh, what I what I probably do sort of mind a little is that, you know, you're not download if you if you buy the online version, it's not just okay. You can get the surround mix to download. Uh, you ha- you're buying a package where you're getting, I don't know, the surround mix and the stereo mix and the mono and I don't know what else you're getting, but you may already have bought those on CD, and you really just want the surround mix. So you have to get things several times, and if you're like us, you're getting it on vinyl and you're getting it on CD. And uh, somehow a download in collectible terms doesn't really seem the same to me as a physical product, you know? Mm. I, think I think I figured it all out now. The 5.1, <laughs> the, the, the Atmos, the Blu-ray audio disc is actually going to be the bonus uh, when they put Get Back Out on Blu-ray again. Uh, the bonus material will include the revolver uh, surround mix. Mm-hmm. So that's why they're doing it this way. You got it, Darren. All right. I'm going to take a nap now, guys. See you. Now, the only thing that I don't understand is that for 5.1, how do you handle the more simple productions of the Beatles where you have less instrumentation, where you're not going to get something different in all five channels? Right. I mean, something like 
for no one. <laughs> I mean, yeah. you've got a bass, you've got keyboard, you got drums, and you got a French horn. Yeah, you can put, um, you know, they do things with ambience, first of all. You know, sometimes the back channels are mostly ambience. Uh, this is the problem. This is the, the case with the McCartney. I finally got the three McCartney albums in a format I can play through my Blu ray player. Mm -hmm. And the first McCartney album, I mean, there, there are certain things like, you know, Karina Croire and, you know, and, and maybe I'm amazed where the surround mixes, you know, they have a lot to work with. But, uh, you know, lovely Linda, there's not much you can do. Um, and uh, so that one is, is, is quite a simple surround mix. It's not, you're, you're not dazzled by stuff coming from the back of you and front, you know, it's, it's just... You're, you're enveloped in it. That's kind of all it is. McCartney 2 and McCartney 3, those are um, uh, ambitious surround mixes. You know, you've got sounds coming from everywhere on those two. So, um, yeah, with simple stuff, they, they may just use ambience and, you know, or you, you could have the French horn coming from the back or, you know, whatever. Mm. They're not, you know, Giles tends not to be a really gimmicky surround mixer. So the idea of having the French horn coming from the back strikes me as something he probably wouldn't do because he's thinking of you, you know, ultimately really looking at the band on a stage, not so much sitting in the middle of everything happening where the French horn player might be behind you. I, I, I think, I, I don't know. I mean, I obviously haven't heard the surround revolver mix yet, but um, I'd be surprised if it was something like that. It, um, for the simple things, I, I think it'll just be a, a fairly simple mix with ambient back channels. Okay. All right. Yes. Um, <laughs> of course, we all know uh, the world has just mourned the loss of Queen Elizabeth II, who passed away on September the 8th. And Paul McCartney wrote a really nice piece on his website going through the many times he met the Queen. Uh, before doing so, he mentioned how at the age of 10, he entered an essay competition in Liverpool and won for his division on his essay about the British monarchy. He also recalled that when the Queen was crowned, everyone on his street in Speak Liverpool got a television set to watch the coronation in what Paul called glorious black and white. Paul said he got to meet the Queen eight or nine times. The Beatles received their NBEs, members of the British Empire medals, before the Queen in Buckingham Palace on October 26, 1965. In December of 1982, Paul and Linda attended an event called An Evening for Conservation. And part of that included uh, orchestral reworkings of Beatles songs and Paul and the Queen chatted about them. In June of 96, the Queen attended the opening for Paul's Liverpool for Performing Arts, the same old school where Paul and George Harrison attended and the Queen made a donation as well. The following year, 1997, it was a very proud day for Paul when he was knighted before the Queen. Paul also celebrated the Queen's Golden Jubilee by performing at the party at the Palace concert held June 3rd, 2002, and on stage, he sang Her Majesty for the Queen. A decade later, Paul and his wife, Nancy, attended an event called Celebration of the Arts at the Royal Academy of Arts in London and met the Queen there. Paul also performed in front of the Queen for her Diamond Jubilee on June 4th, 2012. And the last time Paul and the Queen met was in 2018, when Her Majesty gave Paul the Companion of Honor Medal. Paul said that every time he met the Queen, he was impressed with her sense of humor and great dignity. And there will be a funeral this coming Monday, September the 19th. I wouldn't be surprised if Paul showed up. You know, if you're knighted, you're supposed to attend, you know, it would be proper to attend. And, uh, Paul and Nancy could be there. Ringo was also knighted, but Ringo is performing that night. So it's more than likely he won't be there, although Barbara could show up representing him. You know, she is a lady. <laughs> um, 
Queen Elizabeth herself made a great quote about the Beatles on the occasion of her golden wedding anniversary in November of 1997. She said, what a remarkable 50 years they have been for the world. Think what we would have missed if we never heard the Beatles. Of course, she wasn't doing the math right. It wasn't the 50th, 50th anniversary of the Beatles, but her heart was in the right place. She was referring to her marriage there. Uh, Paul McCartney appeared in a tribute to Taylor Hawkins in a concert that took place Saturday, September 3rd at Wembley Stadium. The concert was first broadcast live on MTV YouTube with a one hour edited version being broadcast that night on CBS. Paul appeared with Chrissy Hine to perform a Beatles song he has never done live. Oh, darling. And uh, that was with Paul and Chrissy sharing the lead vocals in a duet. Paul also performed Helter Skelter, though that song was not included in the CBS broadcast. Did you guys see this? Mm -hmm. No, I did not. I saw the BBC version, so um, so it included Helter Skelter. Right. So I believe I was at a <laughs> Mets. I was at the Mets game that night. I think. I think that's where I was. Or was I at another? No, I think I was at a Mets game. You know, but, it's, funny, um, it's funny how Paul has all of these um, uh, songs ready for occasions. I mean, he 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 played Her Majesty at the at the Jubilee mm -hmm. uh, when he got, I think, the Gershwin Medal and played for the Obamas. He had Michelle ready to go. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, I was sort of wonder, uh, I wonder if he sort of works it out that he'll, he'll always have something really appropriate to play on an occasion like that. But why, oh, darling? I don't know. I wonder. Helter Skelter maybe is more. Well, yeah. I wonder if it was requested of him. Mm. So, how did you feel about Paul's performance, Alan? <laughs> um, <laughs> oh, darling. You know, look, Oh, darling is a hard song to sing, even if you were Paul's age when he wrote it. Mm. You know? um, and he was not in shape to sing it really but um chrissy hind actually sang most of it you know yeah. um so i mean the the bits he did it, it was sort of interesting to see a little bit painful just that he that he couldn't really reach those notes um definitely give him an a for effort i mean he was ah. really trying to do it um, and I think he, I think, you know, the fact that he knew that he couldn't really is probably why she sang so much of it, but, uh, you know, and Helter Skelter, you know, Helter Skelter was, was, was better. Mm -hmm. Well, he's been doing it for years now. And yeah. yeah. He's yeah. Real comfortable doing that song. I still don't know why he does. He always, he puts, seems to put himself in these situations. Yeah. Where he, he's not going to be at his best. Why, oh, darling? I mean, it's, you know, I, I'd love to hear it performed live. I'm okay with not hearing it performed live if he decided, you know what, I can't sing it, do it justice now. Mm. Um, let me do something else. You know, yeah, I, gotta, I gotta wonder in certain situations like these, and also we've talked about when it was the, um, the 50th anniversary was it for Saturday Night Live when Paul did Maybe I'm Amazed and he really wasn't that good at it. Is there any time to rehearse, to warm up? That could be part of the problem. And I'm not trying to make excuses for Paul because we know that it, he's not as capable as he once was at hitting those high notes and his voice is not as powerful as it once was. Although in concert, there are moments when he sounds fantastic still. Mm -hmm. But, you know, why pick this song now? <laughs> Yeah, He's never done it live ever. We all kind of wish he did do it at his concerts. We all thought now, given the shape of his voice, he would never do a song like that live. Why would he pick this? And these one-off shows, he doesn't come across well. Yeah, you know. So I don't know. Pretty interesting, yeah. but nice of him to perform. Uh, you know, at this tribute. I will admit, I'm guilty of not really jumping onto YouTube for those reasons, to see the performances um, after the fact. Because I've read a lot on Facebook from various people about Paul and other performers. And it just wasn't something that, you know, all right, I'm okay. I'm good. You know what you want to see? It's not really Beatles related, but you want to see 
uh, Taylor Hawkins' son perform at that show, and also Eddie Van Halen's son, Wolfgang Van Halen. The, the two of them, I, I thought, were just astonishing, you know. Okay. Uh, anyway. You watched the whole thing, Alan? Um, no, I didn't watch it. I ha actually have the whole thing, uh, <laughs> but I flipped through it. And, um, you know, those two clips I saw basically via Twitter, people posted them. And so I, I watched them, but, uh, and then I looked at them again when I got the, the file of, of the show. Um, yeah. So I, I haven't had time because the whole show's like six hours. Mm. So I haven't had the time to do that yet, but, um, but I, and there's going to be another tribute, isn't there? I think. I think they're going to do another one in LA or something. Hmm. I haven't heard. I didn't hear that either. All right. Well, the Beatles came up big in this year's 74th Creative Arts Emmy Awards with their documentary Get Back winning several awards, including Outstanding Directing for a Documentary Nonfiction Program, going to Peter Jackson. Outstanding documentary or nonfiction series, Peter Jackson, Paul, Ringo, Yoko, Olivia, and Claire Olson. Outstanding picture editing for a nonfiction program. Outstanding sound editing for a nonfiction or reality program, single or multi-camera. And outstanding sound mixing for a nonfiction or reality program, single or multi-camera. Sound editing and sound mixing. All right, five awards right there. Congratulations to the team, Peter Jackson and company. So well-deserved. Yep. Uh, it's great to see it acknowledged this way. Uh, McCartney's 321 documentary with Rick Rubin was nominated for Outstanding Cinematography for a Nonfiction Program, but lost out to a 100-foot wave. Okay. Um, this just seems so old now. <laughs> this must have been a few weeks ago I wrote this. Uh, the home of John Lennon's mother, Julia, will be going under the hammer at Omega Auctions. The three-bedroom house on Bloomfield Road in Liverpool played a significant role in the developing musical relationship between John and Paul McCartney. The two of them rehearsed at the house with the Quarrymen bandmates. Lennon's mother, Julia, lived in the home with her husband, John Bobby Dykins, from 1950 until her death in 1958 with John's half-sisters, Julia Baird and Jacqueline Dykins. John was a frequent visitor while he lived with his Aunt Mimi on Men Menlove Avenue. And this auction will be online and is expected to fetch 250,000 pounds. And the auction uh, will finish on September 26th at 1900 uh, BST, British Standard Time. We should go in on this. <laughs> 250,000 pounds doesn't sound like too much money, but uh, considering the history of this house. Yeah. Wow. Julian Lennon uh, has hosted a special. He hosted this yesterday uh, called Jude Behind the Album. Um, this was on Wednesday, September uh, the 16th. This was an interactive event on the platform called Looped. It was hosted by Nicole Alvarez from the radio station KROQ. It was live at 12 p.m. Pacific time. And I was told you had to sign up for this and the event had sold out pretty quickly. Julian's album Jude just came out last Friday, September the 9th. Now, this is interesting. Yoko Ono and the Plastic Ono Super Band Live in Japan concert is being released in Japan by Idol Records on all streaming services on September the 20th. Yoko had a superstar lineup for a band consisting of Michael Brecker on sax, Randy Brecker on trumpet, Steve Gadd and Rick Murata on drums, Dave Grolnick on keyboards and Steve Kahn on guitar and Andy Musan on bass. This concert was the first of six concert performances in Japan from Yoko and the band from August 1974, and it coincided with the final day of the One Step Festival in Tokyo. According to our recent guest, Madeline Baccaro, uh, she already has this on CD. It was released in Japan on CD. There's supposed to be a vinyl edition coming out on October the 28th. The actual title is called Let's Have a Dream 1974 One Step Festival Special Edition. 
and there is the possibility of a DVD release. Hopefully we'll find out more about this. I know that Madeline uh, got her CD from someone that she knows in Japan who ordered it for her. Don't know about internationally how it's going to be handled. I saw it on uh, Amazon last night and um, made a note for myself to either look into it more or find out exactly. Uh, I forget what the price was. It looked like a pretty cool set and a very interesting performance. Hmm. So, um, yeah, I was checking that out last night online. Okay. Well, hopefully, like I said, we'll, we'll know more soon. The Beatle fan is reporting that a four CD set of George Martin's pre Beatles work will be released on Cherry Red Records on yeah. November 25th in the UK. It'll be called George Martin, a painter in sound. There's a brand new uh, TV commercial for the Peacock channel in which they're using the Beatles song all together now. Um, also, I should report here, I'm talking about all this Lennon activity, Sean Lennon will be performing October 5th through the 8th at John Zorn's Performance Space, now located at the New School in New York City. Sean will be premiering an instrumental project called Asterisms. There will be no advanced ticket sales for this. It's 8 p.m. at the door. The concerts start at 8.30. Tickets are walk up, first come, first serve. And this is a very small venue with a capacity of only 62 people per night. Masks and vaccination proof will be required for entry. This is for uh, the stone at the new school located at 55 West 13th Street. So those of you interested in seeing Sean live, there's your chance for uh, four nights in a row, it looks like. All right, um, I wanna report, I don't know if I said this in a previous show, the Super Mega Fest going on uh, September 30th through October the 2nd at the Westford Regency Inn in Westford, Massachusetts. Pete Best will be a special guest there all three days. Not only that, but the Circle will be there as well. This is the band, the American band, that toured with the Beatles in 1966. And um, I'm told that only on the Saturday, Pete Best will drum with the band. Okay, they'll also be the Beatles tribute band, the Onos performing uh, there that weekend. And also the George Harrison tribute, formerly known as Harry Fest, will take place October the 29th at White's in Westport, Massachusetts. And finally, Record Store Day, which will be a busy day for Beatle fans, November 25th. We'll see the release of several Ringo Starr uh, special releases. Ringo's Old Wave album will be coming out on vinyl from the label Culture Factory USA, and only 2,000 copies will be made. Um, there will be a smoke brown vinyl, and I'm also told there'll be a bonus track that's never been released before on vinyl. I'm just wondering if it's the bonus track that was on the CD that came out on uh, the Right Stuff label in 1994. There was a bonus track for As Far As We Can Go, which was an earlier version. Of... I know what it is. You do? I do. It is, uh, includes the bonus track As Far As We Can Go early version. Okay, there it is. Okay, I thought it would be that. But uh, that's pretty interesting. And it's on CD also. They are putting it out on CD as well. Oh, okay. Very good. The CD is going to be limited to 500 copies uh, from Culture Factory. And why do they have them listed separately? But they do have them listed. I think that's going to be a little harder to find, the CD. They have them listed separately on the website, the Record Store Day website. Uh, the LP and the CD. The LP is 2,000 is the quantity. Hmm. Um, so the CD will be trickier to find. I'm just glad to see it back in print, even if it's limited edition here. But uh... Cult Culture Factory is very cool. I've, I've, I've many of their releases, especially their Record Store Day releases from other artists. Hmm. Okay. Well, as far as we can go, I've always loved that song. And there's a version that uh, Ringo was working on in 1978, around the time of um, Bad Boy, 
that's how that song even originated from that time period. And if you wanted to listen to it like right now, where was it released originally? On the reissue of the CD? It was on the right stuff. The right stuff release, right. Okay. Came out in 1994, I think, yeah. the year. Same year they did the same thing with Stop and Smell the Roses. Right. Which is, I'm surprised, is, unless they're saving Stop and Smell the Roses for a record store day next year. Because I would thought, I would think that, you know, putting them both out um, at the same time would be cool, but maybe it's going to turn up next year. Maybe. I'll have to wait and see. I wish there were archival sets for all of Ringo's albums. Hmm. Not limited versions that come out. Um, we have Ringo's Live at the Greek Theater 2019. Recorded September 1st that year, that's coming out, which for a while has been available to stream on the Coda Collection video channel, which is available to Amazon Prime members. And there will be two versions of Ringo the Fourth coming out, one on translucent orange, the other translucent blue. And there is one more, Ken, uh, that you don't have, I guess. And that is this what looks like it's going to be a really cool compilation album on dark horse records um a single lp called the best of and i'm trying to make out what the best of 1974 to 1977 uh it is going to be let's see if it's on colored vinyl it doesn't say but it's going to feature a couple of ravi shankar songs Two from Splinter, two from Attitudes, that's side one. Flip to side two, two from Stair Steps, one solo Kenny Burke, two from Henry McCullough, and uh, the last song will be, how is it said? Is it Jiva or Jiva? Jiva, I believe. And uh, their song, Take My Love, will wrap up the 12-song album uh, that's coming out. A quantity of uh, 21, 2,150 copies on Dark Horse Records. So that'll be out as well on Black Friday Record Store Day. That's really great that they are doing that. Yeah, it's and it's a very cool cover too. It's got the, it's got the, you know, the logo on a black, uh, black background and Dark Horse Records and uh, the font of the label in red. So that's going to be a very cool collection. I'm glad they're doing it because they did reissue these titles, but only digitally. Right. I don't know if they put out all the Dark Horse albums, but I know some of them were were made available digitally, and it would be nice to get them <laughs> on disc or LP. At least now we'll have this 12-song collection. So um it says label contained. I'm trying to see. Yeah, I don't see any other information in terms of colored vinyl or any of them. But so that'll be out as well. Yeah, that's one I think I'm going to go for. <laughs> yeah. All right. Good to represent all the different artists on that label for people who are new to exploring Dark Horse and all the different artists they had. And I'm assuming that with, you know, there's, there's I know there's a new Joe Strummer release. That is either out or coming out. I, Billy Idol is actively recording on Dark Horse, right? Uh, so I guess it's a way for them to kind of keep the label visible. Maybe they've got uh, some some more new exciting things for the new year. So, all right, we'll have to wait and see about that. Right. I'm sure there was already a Billy Idol EP that came out. Yeah, was it a Chris? Was it his Christmas EP, or that might have been another release of his? I th want to say I thought I saw a second thing from Billy Idol coming out, but again, this stuff all whirs past you with emails, press releases, and you know, and uh, well, there you are. But uh, I'm things were fast when you get older. <laughs> glad to see how active Dark Horse is right now. But I, I would really prefer it if they would reissue all their albums on CD. I'm still a CD guy, so. Yes. Very well, that does it for the news. And Ken, thanks for all of that. Mm -hmm. uh, now, I have no idea what the topic is because I forgot. No, I'm just kidding. Um, today's show is going to be a, a spotlight on the years that we think are the pivotal years of the Beatles 
solo period starting, I guess technically you could say starting in 1968, but really starting in 1970 onward. Um, the three years that we think are the biggies, whether they be big years for us personally, or whether we literally looked into each year and uh, singled that year out as being a big year period in terms of record sales, concert appearances, landmark events, etc. So three years starting in 70, or if you want, 69 or a 68. Uh, and uh, let's begin with Ken, since this was Ken's idea. Yeah, well, you know, there's so many great years we've had in the solo careers of the Beatles. And sometimes I kind of resent whenever people take a look at those first five years of the 70s and say, that was it. That was their golden period, because there's a lot of great music that followed. But you have to admit that the mere fact that John was alive then, John was active then. There were a few years when all four of them released albums. You know, that can have a way of overshadowing other years. But it is very possible that in years where there was less, um, there were less releases. If you think those releases were really powerful, you might think those years were better. Um, the three years that I picked, well, the number three year for me actually is past 1975. And I wanted to say 1989. And the reason why is because, well, Paul released his Flowers in the Dirt album, which to this day is still my favorite album from him, Post Beatles. And that includes all the Wings material and the Firemen. Um, it's, it's an album that um, I never get tired of hearing, and I love every single track on there. It sounds so incredibly fresh to me, and I love the collaborating with Elvis Costello. Um, I don't look at it as a return to form for Paul following uh, Press to Play because Press to Play is my second favorite McCartney album. But um, I love the whole ladies period with McCartney, Tug of War, um, Press to Play and Flowers of the Dirt being three of, I, I feel, his greatest albums. But in addition to Flowers in the Dirt coming out, you had the first tour from Paul since really 1979 the uk tour but in the united states in 76 so it'd been a long long wait and um you know i just remember <laughs> 1976 like i was fortunate to see wings one time thinking well paul's going to tour all the time in the u.s not thinking i'd have to wait 13 years to see him so when that happens you know i saw a lot of shows between 89 and 90 and in addition to all that, Ringo toured, which was the biggest shock of all. His yeah. very first all-star band tour was in 1989 when there, was, um, there were rumors that he was going to tour. I was denying it on the radio, thinking, thinking of his own band, not an all-star band, but being mainly Ringo singing all the songs and being, well, probably in a way similar to the all-star band lineup front man and drummer but being more like the roundheads kind of a thing um i didn't i wasn't told anything about the all-star band concept but um what a treat it was to finally see ringo on the road for the very first time and uh, you know i've loved all the all-star band lineups through the years they've all been special they're all killer bands and that first time he really padded the lineup there with so many great musicians on stage a lot of people to this day think that was the best lineup but when you think about the fact that for the first year ever you had two beatles touring in the same year mm -hmm. plus paul delivering flowers in the dirt that's always been a very special year for me for those reasons you know um i wish there were there were more solo beatle albums coming out that year in 89 there was only Flowers in the Dirt, but what a killer album that is for me personally. Um, my number two pick would be 1970. Um, 1970, you had two albums from Ringo, Sentimental Journey and Buku's of Blues. I love those albums more and more through the years, 
And I love the fact that Buku's of Blues in particular has really gained in stature, considering the fact that Ringo is so suitable for doing country music. But I love the fact that he took a chance and did standards for his first solo album. Yeah. Well, he wasn't trying to be a trendsetter in any way. He was just trying to do, well, as he said, songs that his parents loved, you know. And um, yeah, I, I, I enjoy that album quite a lot, Sentimental Journey and Buku's of Blues. Then what can you say? You had the McCartney album coming out, which went to number one. Right at the same time, Let It Be was coming out. They both hit number one. Um, I love the simplicity of the first McCartney album. In, in terms of his entire catalog, it's not, probably not even anywhere in my top 10. But I still love the overall feel and the vibe of it and the indie feel that it has now and the fact that Paul played all the musical instruments and how new that was at the time. And then you also have uh, the Plastic Ono Band album coming out, which a lot of people look at as being John's greatest album. Of course, we all have our own opinions, but artistically, what a triumph it was for him to do that, something so bare and so raw. Some people look at it as a precursor to punk rock. Um, but no doubt about it, it was a brilliant album stripped down as bare as you can make it with just John and Klaus Foreman and Ringo and um, little Billy Preston in there. <laughs> um, and uh, oh yeah, Phil Spector with Love playing the piano. But it's, it's such a fantastic album. And then what can you say about All Things Must Pass? You know, to a lot of people, it's the greatest solo Beatle album. And um, what a shock it was to the world that George could not only give us good songs, but so many great songs all at once. To have two albums of strong material, plus as a bonus to have the Apple Jam album, which admittedly I don't play that much, but it's still a cool idea to throw that in there as an extra. Um, you know, song per song, all things must pass as a masterpiece. The only thing I've ever questioned about that is why do you need version two of, of uh, Isn't It a Pity? But aside from that, every single song on there is a winner for me. I love everything about the songs. I love the production. I wouldn't change a hair about it. The original mix uh, that Phil Spector worked on with, with George. When you think about it, five albums all in one year <laughs> from the solo Beatles, plus you had the Let It Be album coming out. That was a tremendous year in terms of their creative output. And then my number one year has to be, without a question, 1973. Um, you had Living in a Material World, which is my favorite album of all time from any artist. That's just a personal favorite of mine because I love George's spiritual side. And the songs on there, I think, are the most meaningful and touching um, for me personally. I, I just think that what he was saying in some of the songs i mentioned this before like be here now and the light that has lighted the world and who can see it um those are unbelievable songs for me that that uh it's hard to to surpass those in my mind with what george was, was saying in the song i love the production on the album i love george's vocals and how he delivers on every single song because sly guitar work is impeccable like it always was um but that is my favorite album, period. You've got two albums coming out that year from Paul with Wings. You had Red Rose Speedway and Ben on the Run. And sandwiched in the middle of that was this, this single called Live and Let Die. I mean, two number one albums from Paul, uh, a song that became a classic hit for him with Live and Let Die. Um, ben on the Run coming out at the end of the year. And then to top all that off, you've got the Ringo album, which... I guess most people would say is Ringo's best album, certainly is one of his best albums. Really, every single song on there was a winner. You had all four Beatles participating. You had a lot of great musicians throughout the throughout that album. Members of the band are on there. Um, you got a song that Randy Newman wrote. You got uh, material that was strong without having the other Beatles on them, like Oh My My, for example. You even have a song that George Harrison wrote with Mel Evans. <laughs> what a what a great album and that's one of the greatest album closers too you and me babe 
um, you know, the way it starts with I'm the greatest. It really was brilliantly done. Richard Perry deserves a ton of credit for the great production on that album. Um, hard to top photograph, you know, could easily be the best single Ringo has put out, or even I might even call it the best single any of the solo Beatles ever put out. It's such a masterpiece. And then you've got John Lennon's Mind Games album, which I think is the most underrated of all of his studio albums. And I like every single song there on Mind Games. I think it's really solid all the way through. Um, it's so overlooked. There are gems on there, like Out the Blue and I Know I Know. I love I Sue Masen and You Are Here and the title track to me is a fantastic single. Love the production on that. Very Phil Spector-esque, I think. Um, but when you put all those albums together, another year with five solo Beatle albums, it's just that uh, I think that overall, in terms of quality, 73 was the best year in terms of output from all of them. Um, 1970 ain't shabby either, but 1973 to me will always be the best. Um, and there's so many really good years after 1975, but I wanted to make sure 1989 was represented in some way. It's just so special to have two Beatles in the same year touring and first time ever for Ringo. And those are my three. I wish that we had some effects that we could do, we could play here because I was going to start fading up Frank Sinatra's uh, It Was a Very Good Year uh, <laughs> behind you as you were wrapping up there. So Ken goes with 1973 as his number one year. 1970 is his number two year and his third, 1989. So let's see what Alan has. Um, I didn't rank my years. I just did them chronologically. And I am not at all surprised <laughs> that my years are 1970, 1973, and 1989. Oh, uh, no. But... Uh, yeah. Are they really? Uh, yeah. Yeah. I think I, I think I can add some stuff, however, because I also looked at them as, um, you know, not just not just what the releases were, but what the what the years were for the the former Beatles. Um, so with, you know, so I don't end up repeating what Ken said. I'll, I'll say the stuff in between. So, you know, you have McCartney doing McCartney. I mean, 70 was, you know, a, a, it was an incredible year for, for material. As Ken said, it was also a really a traumatic year for them because that was, you know, all the battling about Klein and, uh, and, and splitting up and, and all of that. It was very tough. Uh, McCartney, after putting out the McCartney album, um, which had that uh, in the press copies, it had that self-interview where he kind of makes it clear that, you know, he's out of the Beatles too. Um, and that caused the whole, you know, furor of, you know, Paul quits Beatles and then John being upset that, uh, that Paul announced it first mm. uh, when John wanted to and, uh, but, but had, uh, honored Alan Klein's request that they not talk about it for a while. And, and Paul decided, okay, well, it's been a while, you know, so I'm talking about it. Um, what happens? Paul, as soon as that album comes out, hightails it up to Scotland and spends the spring and summer there. Um, really doesn't even go back to London. Um, he then at the end of that year, goes to France with Linda and their girls. And then they get on a ship and they come to New York and they start working on Ram. So apart from, you know, looking at the McCartney album is what he's doing, you know, in that spring and summer of 1970, he wrote and recorded demos for like 30 some odd songs. You know, I mean, it was, an incredible bumper crop. I and mean, if you look at it in, in, after, after John's announcement that the Beatles have broken up and he goes up to Scotland um, and he's just you know devastated. I mean, all he really comes back with are the lovely Linda, which he even admits in the press release that came out with McCartney is not a finished song. He, he described it as a trailer. Um, and he intended, at least he said at the time, to 
finish it and you know record it again at some point but this is kind of the the trailer so he's got that and then he's got uh you know that would be something which also is you know it's more of a song than lovely linda but it's still not that much of a song um he comes into himself as he's recording the McCartney album, comes up with Maybe I'm Amazed, comes up with Karina Crory, um, other things. And, you know, some of those things are really just jams with himself that he turns into songs or experimental things like glasses. He manages to come up with an album. After that, goes up in, in the spring and summer, he's got like three albums worth of stuff that he's written and recorded these demos for, then gets on the ship and starts working on RAM. Uh, so if you look at, you know, the calendar for me, he's working on RAM from October until the end of the year. He got really a bunch of RAM done and, um, you know, maybe not that the songs weren't absolutely finished, but he recorded quite a few of them. Um, also wrote Dear Boy during that period. Um, and a bunch of songs that ended up on Red Rose Speedway. So 1970 for Paul, traumatic time, but an incredibly productive time. And then we've got John Plastic Ono Band, George All Things Must Pass, Ringo with Sentimental Journey and Bukus of Blues. And, 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 you know, Ken basically said it, I've got nothing to add about those. Uh, for 73, um, yes, we have Ringo and Photograph in Year 16, and we have Living in the Material World. I, I knew that Ken would pick 73 because I know that's his favorite album of all time. Um, but, you know, it, it, it 73 to me is just unavoidable. Um, <clears throat> so for John, we have Mind Games, but we also have um, the fact that say, you know, August, September 73 is the beginning of his relationship with May Pang. Um, and that was, you know, it's people call it the lost weekend, may even call it the lost weekend in the, in the title of her film. Um, but as she has pointed out, there is nothing lost about that period, you know, he was involved with, uh, you know, not so much in 73 as in 74, but um, you know, back jamming with Paul that one time in March 74 and working with Bowie and working with Harry Nielsen and uh, an awful lot of stuff. And September 73 is when the two of them flew to LA um, and lived there until about May 74. Um, so that too was, you know, it was a productive time. He was working on the rock and roll album. He'd finished Mind Games and put it out. Um, starting to work on Walls and Bridges, although that I think is more in 74 than 73. Um, but still, I, I felt that, you know, in terms of non-album, you know, what else is going on in their lives kind of stuff, I should acknowledge the beginning of, you know, of that, you know, year and a half or so relationship with May. Um, with Paul, okay, you've got Red Rose Speedway, which also has roots in 1970, as I had said. Um, you've got Band on the Run. That's um, an incredible story that I'll just leave for the book. <laughs> um, but you also have James Paul McCartney. Um, mm -hmm that TV special. Now, there are things about that TV special that, you know, you, you slap your forehead watching, you know, dance routines and things like that. But on the other hand, um, that dance routine, Gotta Sing, Gotta Dance, that is a Paul McCartney song that is not available anywhere else. Um, also uh, in the British version, in the, bit at the beginning where he's playing, sitting on a bench playing and Linda's photographing him, he played Bluebird. Um, it was cut out of the American version, but you know, British listeners got to hear Bluebird for the first time. That was gonna be on Band on the Run. That wasn't recorded yet. Um, let's see, he 
played yesterday in there, which is the first time we see him doing a Beatles song um, at the show that it's, you know, at the end, there's a Wings show. We only see a little bit of that Wings show, but um, it was, you know, maybe a 70 minute show or so. And they did a version of Long and Winding Road. Um, that didn't make it into the TV show, but uh, you know, that's, it's kind of interesting. You see Paul beginning to head back towards reclaiming his Beatles catalog. And why is he reclaiming his Beatles catalog? Because in March 73, the Beatles Apple contract with Alan Klein lapsed and the others decided not to renew it. And even in John's case to admit that Paul was right. So 73 is kind of big in that way too. And in addition, and we also have live and let die, but in addition, he went, he did his first with an asterisk UK tour. And the asterisk, of course, is because in 72, they had done that university tour, but that was an unannounced tour. And basically they drove around and stopped in at universities and said, want to hear us play, you know, and um, did the tour that way. But this was a formal tour announced in advance, tickets available in advance, programs printed up. Um, and in fact, it was kind of an interesting thing because um, they played with Brinsley Schwartz's second build. Um, and they also had in between Brinsley and Wings, they had sort of a uh, husband and wife juggling and dog act. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, and, you know, so, you know, Paul wanted it to be like a, a variety show kind of thing, which was also what he had in mind for James Paul McCartney, the, the television show. Um, so, you know, again, we've we've got a, apart from the couple of albums coming out here and there from each of the, you know, Ringo, George, John, uh, and Paul's two albums. We have all of that other stuff for Paul um, and, and some other stuff for John. So that brings us to 1989. And so, yeah, Flowers, Paul's first tour since 76. Um, 79. Goes, hmm? 79. Oh, well, 79 in England, right, right, forgot. Uh, and it could have been 80. <laughs> If he had managed to tour Japan. Um, <clears throat> um, for Ringo, um, now this, Ringo and George, this will strike you as eccentric given um, the way I've generally speaking trashed compilation albums um, over the years here on this show. Um, but in 1989 from George, we have Best of Dark Horse, which also had two new tracks on it, Poor Little Girl and Cockamamie Business. Um, so that's at least a little bit more new music from George. Um, I'm really picking 1989 for the Paul and Ringo stuff, but I was looking for what else uh, was going on. Uh, and for Ringo, there was, he didn't have an album coming out before that tour, but he did have Starstruck, which was a greatest hits album. Mm -hmm. um, so th there's at least those two. For John, I'm kind of stuck um, because there were no big John releases in 1989, but the very end of 88, and so we can say it kind of spills over into 89 feeling wise. First of all, there is the greatly reviled for good reasons the Lives of John Lennon by the dreaded Albert Goldman. Um, but at the same time as that, there was also the film Imagine John Lennon, um, you know, that Andrew Salt put together that, you know, was really kind of a, you know, songs were cut and, you know, edited to be shorter and all that to fit in the film and all of that stuff. But it was really kind of a good overview of John's life um, at that time. And it included, the album included and, and the soundtrack of the film um, song called Girls and Boys, which was we later knew as real love. Mm -hmm. um, the Beatles added their stuff to it. So 
So there's a, you know, and that's, it's really 88, but it's close enough to the end of 88 that um, it's actually in the Jewish year that would correspond with 1989, <laughs> just after Rosh Hashanah. Uh, anyway, um, yeah. And the only other thing about 89 that, you know, I basically personally have to include is because that was the year that I met both Paul and Ringo, interviewed Ringo for the first time and was in a roundtable discussion with Paul. Um, so we didn't do a one on one interview until 90. But, um, you know, I was in in the room with two of the Beatles in 1989. So for me, that's going to be a big year. It's just going to be a big year. What can I say? There we are. Like All this. right. So, Alan, same thing, 1970, 73, and 89. Yep. And I'm going to um, go with the fact that I kind of took this literal uh, and looked at each year for the four solo Beatles output and felt that once 1976 arrived and John had stepped away from making music uh, and Ringo sales began to tail off, those years I found very difficult to include in this list because I was looking for uh, activity from all four of the Beatles when I picked my years. Mm -hmm. um, of course, John came back with Double Fantasy in 1980, and then uh, John was 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 murdered. Um, George's output slowed uh, over the course of the 1980s, but then Cloud Nine was and the Traveling Wilburys projects were great but then after that it was very quiet from george and we know he passed in 2001 um so i ended up picking four years where the four of them were active and as i'm looking at these years i think two of them actually would be years i'd stick with if i was keeping if if, if i was going to change my picks and go the way you guys went and they were years that for me personally were pivotal years. Two of them I think I would leave alone uh, in there as well. So I will start with 1973. Um, for me personally, 73 was probably the year when I began to get it, for lack of a better way of putting it. I, was, I turned eight in 1973 and uh, if memory serves correct, the first McCartney album I owned was Red Rose Speedway on cassette and got banned on the run on cassette not long after that. I might have gotten them like in 74. I don't recall, but and, and, and I think it's a fairly safe bet. Those were the first solo albums I owned. So the door had opened now uh, to this this new world of Beatles music. Wings were all over the place. John Lennon was uh, pretty much all over the place as well. George with Give Me Love, Give Me Peace on Earth. By the end of the year, Ringo, you couldn't turn the radio on without hearing Ringo. So for me personally, even though that's the big year for them collectively, if you're looking at success in commercial terms, and um, for me personally, I think 73 would be the biggie because I have the found fond memories of uh, some of the hits being played on the radio and getting the 45s and again, the cassette copies uh, of Red Rose Speedway and Band on the Run. Um, not solo Beatle related, but I don't think either one of you mentioned that the Red and Blue albums came out in 73, which was sort of a cherry on top uh, uh, for me. Um, I think I, again, Probably a year or two later, I got many of these records. Uh, but 73 is set up to basically be a the year. And it was also probably has my favorite music and some of the first things that I really was able to sink my teeth into as I got older, now eight years old. So uh, I really can't elaborate any more than you guys did with, with rundown of what came out there during those years, except and I don't know if really anyone cares. Some of the personal recollections that I have, like seeing uh, my love in a, in a jukebox in a neighborhood pizzeria, one of those old jukeboxes, we could actually see the record spinning around through a little window and the Red Rose Speedway logo on the label, which I found just mesmerizing. And I don't know why that was, but 
and being different mm-hmm. and playing the B-side. I seem to be, I was aware, I think, that the mess was, um, I don't know if I knew on non-album tracks, probably didn't, which makes me wonder if I had the cassette maybe earlier than I, than I, than I did. Because the mess, I'd play it and I kind of, oh, it's live. That's kind of different. Um, Mind Games was, uh, um, Power to the People probably was my first John Lennon song. It's the first single I owned of John's. But Mind Games was is one of my favorite all-time Lennon tunes. And even at eight years old, that resonated with me. Even the B-side, Meat City, uh, was kind of, was kind of fun and that's another one of my all-time favorite Lennon songs because of that single that came out in 73 for some reason I knew give me love give me peace on earth but it didn't hit me over the head as much for whatever reason and then at the end of the year along comes Ringo and all of a sudden Ringo and photograph was everywhere and I got the photograph single and it was so cool hearing him on the radio all the time It seemed that way. Um, I grew up listening to probably by 73, 74, most of the radio, if I had control of the radio or asked, could you put the radio station on for me? It was WABC, Music Radio 77. And it just seemed like Ringo was constantly on as those hits off, off the Ringo album were coming out. So 73 is my first year. Not only probably my personal pick, but I think it's an obvious pick for it being the year because all four of them were at the top of their game. They had new music out. They were on the charts. And uh, a photograph came out towards the end of the year, might have hit one in the early stages of 74. Photograph? Photograph number one in November of 73. It did go to number one in November. So John was the only one maybe in commercial terms where the numbers weren't earth shattering. Mind Games album, Mind Games single both did well, but they weren't chart toppers. But I remember Mind Games being a constant on the radio. That's just how I remember. I think the rest of these next two years are more of my looking at the years as being um, Years that featured all four Beatles enjoying a great deal of success, uh, being uh, in the in the public eye a great deal. The second year that I'd go with is 1971. And again, too young to really say that I was aware of what was going on. I did ask for my mom to buy me the Uncle Albert Admiral Halsey single which might have been my first McCartney record. And same thing with Power to the People, which I mentioned before. Um, Two singles that really resonated with me. Um, Family Vacation. I remember going to the Mount Airy Lodge in the Pocono Mountains in 71, early 71, when uh, Power to the People was brand new. And it was on the, uh, there was a few jukeboxes around the resort. And I I, I seem to remember playing it all the time that weekend or week, however long we were there. And then when we got home at some point, my mom bought me the record. I also realized, having no clue what Yoko's music was like, that if you play Touch Me, which was the B-side of of Power to the People, at at 78, uh, you could really antagonize your grandparents, something awful. Uh, so that was, you know, hey, I was six. I didn't, I don't know. <laughs> I had one of the, uh, in 71, I might have still been playing my records on my GE show and tell record player that I think had a 78 setting. <laughs> and if I did it, I made it play at 78. Um, but anyway, back to 71. So that was a big year. You had McCartney coming out uh, with Ram with his first number one hit. Uh, Uncle Albert Admiral Halsey, before that, his first hit period with Another Day and the formation of Wings, which I don't think was an event that had lots of fanfare around it because uh, I, I just seemed like it was a quiet thing. I mean, Alan's book will shed light on 71 with the arrival of Wings. And 
Uh, of course, the end of the year, Wildlife um, did well, but not as well, I think, as Paul and others thought it would do in commercial terms. But still, 71 was important in that Paul had his first hit, his first number one, uh, scored another near number one album with Ram, which I think in the U.S. topped off at two on the charts, right. if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. 71 was a big year for John because uh, as, as, as important as the John Lennon Plastic Ono Band album was, he was disappointed that the record didn't, didn't do better in commercial terms, didn't sell better, and thought, you know what, what I'm going to do now is write my songs and put a little sugar on top of them to sweeten them up. And the result was Imagine, which was his first number one album. Yeah. And the Imagine single nearly gave John a number one. That was uh, that was another one that just missed. Number three. Number three in the U.S. And interestingly, wasn't a single in other countries, but in the U.S. was. So Imagine was, for some Lennon fans, they might look at that as being John achieved the full package. He already had the critics on his side. We already knew Lennon, the artist. Now he had the commercial sales to go with it. That might have been lacking a bit with uh, John Lennon Plastic Ono Band. Uh, of course, 71 is also the year we get the Happy Christmas War is Over single at the end of the year. Um, which while it didn't chart and I would think it probably got ignored when it first came out because of the way Christmas music was handled when it came to radio play. We all know what that song has become since then. And it originated in 71. And that was the year of the Elastic Oz Band single was that's 72. God Save Us was 71. 71. I think it was. So just to throw that in there too. Uh, I don't think I missed anything with John in 71. 71 was for Ringo the year he had his first hit. And in the countries where Bukus of Blues wasn't released as a single, 71 was the year that Ringo could say, here's my first single, period. It don't come easy. One song, but well, what a song. I think that's amongst the best solo songs by the four of them. And uh, you had George's contributions there. So, you know, they no sooner had broken up, but we there is a semi beetle reunion all over radio uh, with the Don't Come Easy and the cool B-side early 1970. And uh, of course, 71 was the year for the concert for Bangladesh. So that was, if you thought All Things Must Pass was off the charts brilliant, and I can't, I'm, I'm so happy it's George that put it out, you would think Paul or John would have put that out. Well, George, in a way, sort of won up that by coming up with the first ever charity concert. And while the concert for Bangladesh has been dwarfed many times over through the years, in 71, there were few shows like that one that George was behind with Ravi Shankar. And, and again, and you, if you want to throw in the little bonus, there was the Bangladesh single, which was a modest hit for George. Uh, he had earlier in the year, What Is Life was in the top 10, spilling over from 70 from All Things Must Pass. And the Concert for Bangladesh album at the end of the year, which would win the Grammy for album of the year, but that wasn't until 72 or 73. Right. So a Grammy award-winning album came from George in 71. Uh, so that's why I went with 71 as being my second year. And now if I wanted to make a change here at the last minute, I'll tell you this. I had picked 1974 as a big year uh, as one of the pivotal years where all four of them, again, were active and, can, and, and having a great deal of success. Of course, R Ringo's success with the Ringo album spilled into 74 and was quickly followed by Goodnight Vienna. And you had five, hit, you had six singles coming off those two albums, all six of them, top 40 hits. Five of them uh, were top tens and a few number ones in there. Uh, and that a lot of that success happened in 74. Uh, Your 16, the second Ringo single, the third one being Oh My My. I'm imagining those, most of their chart success was in early 74. Then Goodnight Vienna comes out and boom, he's got two more huge hits. Only You and You Alone and uh, No No Song. And then the third single, 
which wasn't a big hit, but did crack the top 40, was it sold down, excuse me, it sold down to Goodnight Vienna. So killer year for Ringo in 74. A little bit less of an extent for Paul, but again, Band on the Run success was spilling it to 74. Jet was uh, a top 10 hit in early 74. Band on the Run became a number one. Um, the flip side, uh, no, what am I thinking of here? No, I'm thinking of uh, then later in the year, uh, Junior's Farm comes out, another top 10 hit for Wings. The B side, Sally G gets a little love, a little bit uh, on the country charts. Mm -hmm. um, and then Paul gets to work at the end of the year, which we weren't quite aware of it, you know, before the days of the internet with the next Wings album he starts working on. But uh, still enough success there for Wings in 74 to go with Ringo's second straight big year. Uh, John gave us Walls and Bridges, uh, which was accepted a little, little warmer than Mind Games. At least it sold a bit better. And John had his first album that had two singles lifted off it, which hadn't happened yet. Whatever Gets You Through the Night was the big number one. And then number nine, Dream, cracked the top 10. Uh, and that was the first time John had two singles. So Paul, Wings, George, a lesser year for George, but still, he had a record. He had Dark Horse. Uh, so that was going to be the third of my four years till I thought, well, in personal, uh, personally, I might want to swap that out for 1976, the year I turned 11, the year that Wings just... I mean, they were successful before that, but to me, 76, they exploded everywhere. You know, you'd hear wings when you went in the men's room. I mean, to me, in 76, between silly love songs, let him in, then all the news alerts and news stories about the Wings Over America tour and the triple album coming out at the end of the year. Um, so for me personally, I might be inclined on that alone, putting 76 in my top three. And I got really got into George's music with 33 and a third. Liked what I had heard before it. 33 and a third, I think, was the first current George Harrison album I purchased. Uh, and to this day, I actually like it more than all of George's albums, a smidge more than All Things Must Pass, probably because it's a bite size <laughs> version. Um, so, so my years were 73, 71, and then sticking with that. Logic 74 or throw in a personal year in place of 74, 1976. But I felt it was necessary to have some significant presence from all four of them. And we all know that we didn't get many years like that. So um, that's the deal. That's the years uh, that, uh, that knocked us out. 89 was a year I loved because, of course, now I'm much older. I'm a man. Some will say I'm still not a man, but technically in 89, I was 24. Mm -hmm. uh, right? Yes. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> I do the math. I already won. <laughs> but 89 was big because of the tours. Yeah. The tours alone. And for me, Flowers in the Dirt, um, what, did you, what did you say? You said Kenneth was not a... A rebirth or something? Did you uh, think not a return to form? As return something. to form, you know, I considered that album. The people that don't like press to play. I know. know what you mean. Yeah, I liked press to play, but I know how it was received even then in the in the late eighties. Hmm. To me, flowers in the dirt uh, was the rebirth. That's where people ah, uh, Paul's put out. A, everybody was into McCartney. He's got a great new record. There was no press to play stinks or. I remember when Press to Play came out at FUV, um, we did play Press a lot, but internally, in-house, we there were lots of debates about whether Press was a good song or a throwaway, and it doesn't say much for the album if that's the advanced single. It still got played. There was none of that when Flowers in the Dirt came out. Everyone was on board, and wouldn't you know he's going back out on tour. For me, it was the first time in a lifetime. 13 years after Wings Over America was a lifetime, right. you know, and seeing all four of the Madison Square Garden shows the first week in December, memories I will never forget. And 
and the unbelievable was Ringo touring. And what a great idea he came up with for the all-star band and yeah. seeing that show at Jones Beach Theater in 89. Well, that was David Fishoff that came up with the idea, really. All right, I'm going to give Ringo the success, uh, the, the credit <laughs> there. But but it, was a, it really was not a unique idea. You didn't reinvent the wheel, whoever thought of it. But right. it was a great idea. Now look at where we are now today. Ringo's touring with the All-Star Band. There's a new All-Star Band album coming out on vinyl. So, so those are the years. What do you think? What are your picks? <laughs> you can share them with us. And we want you to. In the comments section, which is down there. If you're watching us on YouTube. If you want to shoot us, you know. Not shoot us, but if you want to send us a email or a Facebook post or something like that and tell us what your years are. We'd love to know. I was going to guess that's it. 1976 was a very strong consideration for me yeah. because of the Wings Over America tour, but also because of 33 and a third Wings at the Speed of Sound. I mean, my memories of Wings at the Speed of Sound, apart from having two monster hits with Silly Love Songs and Let Him In, was hearing virtually every single cut being played on FM radio. Yes. I even heard Cook of the House on, on FM radio. And in 76, what FM station would you have? I know you're originally from Long Island. Right. For me, it was WPLJ was playing like half the album to oh. the point where I didn't know what the singles were. Yeah. No, PLJ was the station for me there. And yeah, they played Wino Junko. They played yeah. My Love. They played Time to Hide a lot. You know? I think I remember hearing uh, She's My Baby and Beware My Love more than Silly Love Songs. So I was not, I don't, I may not have been aware of what was a single and what wasn't. I think I, as I, is the, you know, at that point thought maybe She's My Baby was a single as well, the way it was get, be, being treated. Yeah. yeah. But I mean, it just goes to show you that McCartney not only did so well on top 40 radio, but the FM stations were playing the album cuts too. Yeah. So he got radio saturation at that time. And yeah, I also think of 76 to 33 and a third and not only the songs from that album, but to me still the greatest episode ever of Saturday Night Live when George was on there with Paul Simon mm -hmm. and performing together. And uh, yeah, it was, it was an incredible year. And then you also had even though, you know, I don't see that big a difference in quality. I know I'll be debated on this between Gennad Vienna and Ringo's Rodeg of Yore. You know, there's a lot of worthwhile songs on Ringo's Rodeg of Yore. You do have activity from John, since he did Cook It in the Kitchen of Love. But that was the weakest of the songs that he gave to Ringo. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, three solo Beatle albums that year. Not bad at all. Plus the tour. And I do like what you said about the, the record label for, for My Love, the single. The, you got to give Apple a lot of credit for what they did with their labels. All the different colors for the apples. Let me ask you, let me just jump in one second. I don't mean to interrupt you because you bring something up that I'm interested in, Ken. And Alan might, I don't know if, I don't know how much, Alan, you want to talk about things that are going to be popping up in your book. But a long time ago, I had heard that one of the reasons the wing singles came on these custom labels was because McCartney was trying to distance himself from Apple. So wildlife had custom labels without that just said an Apple record and the singles that came out in 72 were the same thing. Not everything because you had the singles like live and let die were on Apple, a standard Apple label. But I had heard that a lot of those records at that time were coming out on these custom labels so that the Apple would sort of be hidden. Yes, yes. They designed those labels themselves. And, uh, and, and even saying an Apple record on the cover or on the label was a battle for them. Um, you know, they were required to. Um, but each time there was a back and forth about, you know, why, why do we have to do this? And, uh, but, but yeah, they, they designed those labels specifically to not have an Apple, which is kind of, you know, ironic in a certain way, because the Apple label was also Paul's design. You know, it, it was it was his idea of a Granny Smith Apple the, because of the Magritte picture that he owned. Um, 
and uh, so it, it, it's too bad he wasn't able to use it and until later he felt a bit better about it. But, uh, you know, by the time uh, Live and Let Die came out, Klein was out of the picture. So That's right. I was yeah. just going to ask you, because some of the singles then that came in 73 and 74 were on the standard Apple label. Why? Well, now we know why. Mm -hmm. But Ken, you were talking about the colors. Not only the colors, but I mean, I, I just thought, the label for Ringo singles from the Ringo album where he's on the label yeah. outfit, you know, that silver aluminum outfit, whatever he was wearing. How cool was that spinning on your turntable <laughs> as a 45? They came up with some really brilliant ideas. And with that, we know what years that are pivotal for us when it comes to the years of the four Beatles solo. Um, again, I was serious about that. We'd love to know what your picks are. A bunch of different ways you could submit those. Um, in the meantime, let's uh, wrap things up by going uh, round robin here and uh, just basically uh, giving out our personal info. I don't know if you all, if we can go round robin when you got three people, but uh, we'll go robin at least and uh, start off with Ken. Okay, thank you, Darren. If you want to get in contact with me, my email address is everylittlething at att.net. You do have my website, which is kenmichaelsradio.com, which has loads of audio interviews with Beatle people and weekly Beatles trivia. In fact, if you get to hear or uh, watch this show in time during this week, I have a Beatles and Queen Elizabeth trivia question for this week um that's at kenmichaelsradio.com wait i know the answer hot smoking fbi members sorry you're close <laughs> um also uh my other podcast show talk more talk a solo beatles video cast the next show will be on monday september the 18th at 9 p.m eastern we'll be reviewing all four tracks of Ringo's EP3. And uh, I do want to make mention of my syndicated radio show, Every Little Thing, um, because in our last show, I mentioned that for those of you that have never heard the show before and you don't feel like listening at a specific time because there is a page on my website that lists all the radio stations, broadcast times uh, when the show airs, with links to their websites, but you might not want to wait till that specific time. The show has never been on demand before until recently. WFDU, Fairleigh Dickinson University Station, um, they run my show Sunday mornings at 6 a.m. Eastern. They are now posting uh, my most recent shows that they aired for two weeks. So there's two shows there on their recent archives page. And we're going to have that in our description box. If you'd like to listen for the next two weeks, you got two shows there to listen to whenever you want. In addition to that, and this is something super cool. One of the radio stations that airs every little thing based out of Canada is an oldie station called FM 108. They're an internet only station. And on John Lennon's birthday, October 9th, they're going to be running a 24 hour marathon of my show every little thing. So we're going to put the link in our description box. If you'd like to check it out, you got the whole day, all day long. What better way to celebrate John Lennon's birthday than with Beatle music and solo Beatle music and me as well with every little thing on FM 108. And um, I will be on Sam Wiles uh, podcast, Paul or Nothing, talking about the Driving Rain album. And that should be coming out fairly soon. Okay, that's all. All right. Thank you, Ken. And Alan, over to you. Okay. You can reach me on Facebook, um, either under Alan Cozen or Alan Cozen Remix. Also check out the McCartney Legacy Facebook page. Um, you can contact all of three of us by email at things we said today, radio show at gmail.com. It's one word, things we said today, radio show at gmail.com. We have a Twitter feed at things we said fab, and we have two Facebook pages. 
two more Facebook pages. I, I've been threatening this for a while, but it's going to become a third one that will replace the first two. Stay tuned. But at the moment, they are Things We Said Today Beatles radio fans and just plain old Things We Said Today. Um, you can find the shows. Uh, we hope you're watching this on YouTube. Um, we also have the audio version, audio only uh, on it's available through Podbeam, which distributes to all kinds of other places like iHeartRadio. If you're only listening to the audio one right now, try the YouTube page. And while you're at the YouTube page, go back to episode 355, our chat with Peter Jackson, and um, have a look at that. If you haven't seen it yet, it will take you four hours. Maybe you could do it an hour at a time, whatever, but it was a, a really fun episode uh one of our favorites and uh judging from the numbers um one of many of our listeners favorites too um so i think that's about it for me all right and uh, as for me i'm at wfuv radio if you'd like to tune in you can catch me monday through thursday night starting at 10 p.m till 2 a.m and saturdays uh, from one until four Saturday afternoons. Uh, and I'm on Facebook, two pages, come to both of them. Darren DeVivo, send me a friend request. Darren DeVivo, WFEV DJ and Beatles podcaster, I think is the name of the second one. Click follow or like or whatever Facebook calls the button, uh, names the button these days. I think if you liked me in the past and you're not following me now because they changed the way that whole thing works, but um, that's a great way to keep in touch. And if you want to shoot me an email, uh, write me at WFUV. Uh, the shorter address uh, is D DeVivo rather than Darren DeVivo, although they're both the same at WFUV.org. And with that, I want to thank each and every one of you for listening, spending some time with us talking Beatles. And uh, we'll be back in a we can have to two weeks with our next show. So for Alan, for Ken, I'm Darren DeVivo. Thank you for watching things we said today, and we will see you next time. <laughs>